Hi everyone, my name is Douglas Tree. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Brigham Young University in Chemical Engineering, and I'm excited to talk to you today about the development of polymer microstructure, where thermodynamics and kinetics meet, um, which is the topic of my, my, my talk today. I'm grateful to the organizers uh, for organizing the session and for inviting me to speak in it. Um, and so let's dig in, the time is limited, so uh, let's get going. So uh, my group uh, at BYU, we are uh, interested in this question of how to predict the microstructure of polymer materials. Uh, as you well know, microstructure, of course, dictates properties. Um, it, it's uh, largely determinant of the properties of, of polymer materials. Um, but microstructure uh, depends on both thermodynamic forces, which is sort of the, the point of this session, um, and process history. And my group is interested at the interface of those two, uh, uh, of those two phenomena, um, how, you know, how complex thermodynamics, polymer thermodynamics, um, are, uh, you know, and are driven uh, in time and what the dynamics of those are. And we look at those in a number of areas, um, and today I'm just going to talk to you about one of them, uh, and uh, in particular we're going to focus on non-solvent induced phase separation, which is where we spent a lot of our time uh, the last few years following a postdoc that I did in Glenn Fredrickson's group at Santa Barbara, um, where we developed some tools to look at at NIPS. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So uh, what is NIPS, uh, or non-solvent induced phase separation? This is a process by which polymer membranes and other industrial materials are made, uh, specifically porous materials. In this case, you have a polymer that's coated on some substrate, and that polymer is dissolved in some good solvent, and it gets dunked in a large non-solvent bath, and then there's an exchange uh, of uh, solvent and non-solvent uh, across an interface, and that interface leads to, or, or excuse me, that exchange leads to the development of microstructure. And uh, the sort of high level picture is that you have uh, some, uh, you, you can think about this ternary phase diagram where you have a polymer and non-solvent that have some miscibility gap, but a polymer and a solvent that are miscible, and a solvent and non-solvent that at least have some window of miscibility. And if you start with your film uh, out here in this homogeneous region, over time you would expect that it would uh, come quench into the liquid liquid region and phase separate um, and then you would get the polymer branch the polymer uh, the high concentration of polymer branch would uh, would solidify um, this glass transition is probably way too high it's probably you know more like 20 or 30 percent you would solidify and then the others would would just be a solvent branch and that would be liquid and that would you know uh, blow away and and you'd get your microstructure left over um, and so uh, there's observed a variety of different microstructures, um, including sort of these sponges and asymmetric sponges. And it turns out that while these have been observed for a long time, a lot of the mechanism of their origin is not particularly well understood. Uh, and hopefully we'll have time to talk a little bit about that today. So I'm going to talk about two things, uh, trying to get two quick stories in. The first is how do we go about and build and test a model? And then the second one I'll talk about is how, once we've ha we have that model, how do we actually talk about this diffusive driven phase separation? And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So first, how do we go about building and testing a model? So uh, as, as one might imagine, this is actually pretty challenging uh, to build a model uh, of uh, uh, non-solvent induced phase separation. You have, uh, you know, spatially inhomogeneous materials. You've got multiple phases. You've got mass and momentum uh, transport that's going on, and you have a separation of scales between the interfaces, the microstructure, and the geometry. And I liked this example um, from uh, some recent work by the Cabral group um, in, in England, and they were doing uh, non-solvent induced phase separation uh, with these particles. And you can see here, they, what's going on is they're changing the, the polymer concentration. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at this guy, this is at a higher polymer concentration. This is a droplet of the polymer in the non-solvent. And I mean, this is really kind of beautiful to see. They've, they've got the you know, diffusion causes this uh, particle to shrink. Um, and then you get the initiation of, of little domains, if you can even see that there. Uh, and then that forms this solid particle that sort of uh, is this porous microparticle. And so if you think about that, at these scales, you've got, uh, you know, uh, the overall geometry of the droplet you have to take care of. You have the microstructure that's forming in here, the, the porous uh, structure. And then you have the interfaces 
between the the two the liquid or the excuse me between the uh, the two phases they're developing. And so that's a, a separation of scales that makes the problem hard to solve. So uh, we think a particularly powerful approach to going about looking at this um, is uh, to use continuum fluid mechanics and transport phenomena married with what's called classical uh, density functional theory um, uh, or polymer field theory methods. Um, they're they're well-developed methods. They have rigorous connections to uh, to theory and to statistical mechanics, um, and from a numerical standpoint, they allow you to overcome uh, the fact that you have multiple phases by having a, a, a diffuse interfaces, so continuous interfaces between the two phases, and, and we'll see that in a second in these simulations. So I think there's some nice papers on this you can go back and look at. In particular, this is nice review by Marcus Mueller and, and Juan de Pablo uh, that came out a few years ago. Uh, if you're new to the area and you want to learn a little bit more about uh, the dynamics uh, using these kinds of things. So since this is a, a thermodynamics uh, a session, I wanted to sort of uh, highlight uh, uh, what you need to think about in terms of the thermo um, and the connection there. And so you can think about going from an exact density functional theory where you can write down a, a statistical mechanical Hamiltonian and you know doing a Legendre transform. And you might think at this stage you're doing something like dynamic self-consistent mean field theory if you're willing to let your Hamiltonian have a mean field approximation. Um, and you can use that to get a, a free energy functional. Um, and then if you can go through a series of approximations and come out with something quite simple, uh, so if you'd say do the RPA and then for a simple mixture, this reduces to uh, a case where you have a homogeneous free energy term here uh, plus a gradient term. Um, and as my uh, face is covering up, these are sometimes called phase field models. Actually, let's move me up here. So these are sometimes called phase field models. Um, uh, because, you know, this uh, F naught here is what you might get out of uh, classical thermodynamics for a, a mixing free energy um, added on with this interface term. Um, of course, there are other approximations and other ways to go do that. You can uh, check out Glenn's book um, where he talks about uh, a lot of this stuff in detail to sort of understand that. Okay, so if we can write down the thermodynamics that we want, we can write down complex uh, polymer thermodynamics. Um, how do we get transport equations? Um, we have employed what's called uh, the two-fluid model, uh, which is uh, uh, formalism uh, by uh, Degen and Doyen and Nuki that was developed where essentially you have a Lagrangian method where if you plug in a free energy functional uh, dissipation terms that account for the friction um, and constraints, you can come up with a set of transport equations. Uh, uh, and so we do that for a ternary polymer solution. We use this uh, phase field type approach where we have uh, uh, Flory Huggins mixing uh, term and then these uh, gradient terms. Um, we have a Newtonian fluid with a concentration dependent viscosity. That's what my face is covering up here. Um, and then uh, the constraints, we have an incompressibility constraint. So when all that's plugged in, um, you end up with transport equations that hopefully look uh, uh, familiar to you. Um, the transport equations are uh, the convection diffusion equation where we are now coupled to a chemical potential and that chemical potential comes from our free energy functional so we take a functional derivative of that to get the the chemical potential we have a momentum equation which doesn't have an acceleration term so it's a stokes like equation and we have this extra term over here that couples to the chemical potential and this is going to allow us to have marangoni stresses when we have gradients of uh, uh, of uh, concentration and then finally we have an incompressibility term here so now we need to, this is a non, you know, set of nonlinear PDEs. It's time dependent, it's, it's concentration dependent uh, um, diffusion and, and viscosity. So this can be complicated. Um, and we've spent uh, the last couple of years, uh, I, I spent several years in, in, as a postdoc in Glenn's group working on this and, and our groups are now continuing to collaborate to build out software uh, to do this. And so we think we've developed some, some uh, powerful tools to, to do this. Um, we can now uh, handle multiple species, uh, homopolymers, blockopolymers, a variety of boundary conditions and reaction kinetics. And we're incorporating things like fluctuations and uh, colloidal particles or nanoparticles into these kinds of simulations. Um, and so you can read more about that. We have a paper that talks about the, the math of this and the, and the numerical methods. Um, and uh, uh, we spent a lot of time on that, but I don't have much time today. So I want to get to some of the results that we have. So let's look at a test case. This will help us understand uh, some of what's going on uh, 
uh, uh, in the, the second part I want to talk about. I just want to highlight this sort of as a preview or else we, we, we can't understand the next piece. So what you're looking at is this video sort of loops over and over again is a case where I do just a bulk uh, quench to look at the dynamics of a spinodal decomposition in a ternary polymer solution. Okay, so here I again have this uh, uh, ternary phase diagram. So the polymer is, you know, one on this axis, the solvent is up here, the non-solvent down here. And I again, I have a miscibility gap between polymer and non-solvent. And as you can see, I'm initiating uh, the concentration at about here. Oh, there it is, right there. Okay, and that's where the initial concentration is. So of all three components. And what I'm plotting here is just the polymer concentration as a function of space. Okay, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, color plot. Um, and here I'm showing on the face diagram, each one of these blue little points is one little pixel uh, in this uh, uh, space plot. And you can see that I start out and everybody's where I initiated it with a little bit of random noise. Okay, um, and then it uh, quickly face separates and I get, uh, you know, a tie line. And what's going on here, the reason I have something filled all in between is that, the, as you can see, there are interfaces here. And so those interfaces are, you know, also have to be represented. And so, you know, there's places where it's kind of like light blue. Uh, and so there's something in between that, that has to fall somewhere on those tie lines. Okay. Um, the other thing to point out uh, really quick is that um, this has been, uh, this video has been sped up um, and it's actually log scaled, um, which is how the dynamics uh, of coarsening behavior goes, as we'll just see in the next slide. And so you can see that um, I start out counting slow and then I count increasingly quickly uh, to watch as, as these domains sort of begin to merge. And so you'll see that there are two regimes of behavior that are going on. The first is that I initiate spinal decomposition and I have sort of a constant uh, domain size at the beginning. And then as time proceeds, the domains begin to coarsen and aggregate. And it looks like, you know, oil and water in salad dressing that, that you watch as it begins to sort of aggregate and move together. So we can show that by actually calculating the average domain size as a function of time. And you see these two domains, first a flat region where, uh, you know, at the early time it presents a constant domain size. And then there's sort of this kink in behavior um, and it begins to coarsen at a rate. Um, and in this case, that coarsening rate uh, uh, goes like t to the one fourth power, and so on a log log plot, you can see that here. And so we can the these two dynamic regimes are are uh, pretty well understood. The early time regime is uh, an initiation of spinal decomposition, and it turns out you can do a little bit of theory and predict what that uh, the fastest growing mode is, which is what leads to the the initial size and you can uh, predict a rate of that spinal decomposition and that rate uh, is where that sort of kink comes uh, in that curve um, and, and this is uh, kind of fun theoretically but not all that important for us today so i'll move on kind of quickly the more important one is coarsening um, coarsening is that late time regime and it turns out the slope of that plot that you saw on the log log scale is indicative of the mechanism of how the coarsening is happening so what you were seeing was an example of what's called surface diffusion, where the diffusivity along the boundaries of these different domains dominates. Uh, and so that gives rise to a one quarter scaling, which is actually the slowest uh, 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 coarsening process. Um, if you have uh, fast bulk diffusion instead, you get what's the classic Ostwald ripening, which has a slope of one third. This is where the smallest domains disappear and at the expense of larger domains. Um, and then if you have strong Marangoni flows uh, that are internally generated, you get a much faster coarsening rate, which has a slope of one. So it goes like T to the one power. Okay, so uh, that's coarsening. The last thing you need to understand from that uh, picture that we showed uh, earlier is that the morphology of the, the system depends strongly on the initial composition. So uh, I showed you this uh, purple one here. That was the one that I showed you the video for. But if I would have initiated with a smaller polymer concentration, I would have ended up with isolated polymer droplets in a large matrix of uh, solvent. And if I would have initiated with a much larger polymer concentration, I would end up with uh, a continuous polymer phase with, uh, with just non-solvent droplets isolated in there. All right. And what I showed you was something that was sort of nearly bicontinuous. There's this uh, sort of uh, line of symmetry that goes somewhere close to where that purple point is, 
where you get something that's exactly by continuous as it as it phase separates. Okay, so this is important to keep in mind as we look at the future results. Okay, so now with our remaining you know five or six minutes, let's talk about uh, uh, this problem of, of of diffusion driven phase separation. And let me set it up for you a little bit. So in in non solvent induced phase separation, you have a non solvent bath that's you know deriving the the phase separation. Um, and, and the literature, there's been quite a bit of interest in the mass transport. So you have this nonlinear you know, uh, mass transfer problem, and chemical engineers like to, to look at mass transfer, and there's been a lot of nice work done. Um, and there's also been a lot of work, as we just sort of saw, on spinal decomposition kinetics and what happens in phase separations. But it turns out that, uh, you know, as I'm sort of pointing out here in my, my note, phase separation and diffusion are inseparable, right? So you can't have... You know, uh, diffusion actually has to drive a phase separation as well. So there's this interesting coupling between, you know, uh, diffusion that's driving the phase separation, uh, you know, from a bulk standpoint where this exchange is happening, and diffusion is also causing a phase separation at the local micro level. So we want to be able to understand that. So to do that, we, we need to sort of expand our, uh, uh, think about our methods a little bit. Um, and so what we're going to do is two different kinds of simulations. We're going to do a one-dimensional simulation where we can do a really big bath. And as you might imagine, it's hard to do a really large three-dimensional system. Um, and so we do these 1D simulations that look, let us look at the mass transfer. Uh, and then we're going to couple those to two-dimensional and three-dimensional simulations, which are, you know, uh, we can now uh, uh, use time-dependent boundary conditions to couple our solutions together and look at what happens as the microstructure evolves. And so you see me bounce back and forth between these 1D simulations and two-dimensional or three-dimensional simulations to look at the microstructure. Okay. So, and then to, as a last key preview before we get to the final results here, um, we need to think about two key theoretical concepts. The first is that there is a uh, a diffusion time. In other words, that uh, if I want to know how long it, uh, how long it takes before the bottom of the polymer film feels the effect of this diffusion with non-solvent and solvent exchanging at the interface, it's gonna that time is gonna be approximately or it's gonna be proportional to rather the film thickness squared divided by the diffusion coefficient. And that's sort of you can think of it like a boundary layer growing or depending on you know what your sort of uh, uh, how you think about diffusion, but there's sort of a semi-infinite domain that uh, it takes before it reaches the bottom of the film. The second thing to understand is this, sur this phenomena of so-called surface-directed spinoidal decomposition. So uh, in the bulk, there's spinoidal decomposition that happens isotropically, but when you have a surface that orients the way in which spinoidal decomposition happens, and that manifests as sort of a set of propagating waves that last into the bulk of the film until the isotropic takes over at some point, which is related to the uh, relationship between uh, the, the thermal fluctuations in the system and, and the strength of the attraction of that interface. And this uh, latter uh, surface-directed spinal decomposition is a well-known uh, phenomena um, that, that, that's been discussed in literature for a number of years. Okay. So the, there's sort of two, two key results I want to highlight here. The first is that, um, as you might expect, at early times, the presence of the wall doesn't really matter. So you have a, a, a semi-infinite case. And so what I'm showing is that if I take different film thicknesses in one of these 1D simulations, so I start with a different uh, film thickness, and then I uh, quench the system, um, I end up being able to collapse it onto a single variable. And what's kind of nice is that this shows really well on a ternary phase diagram, which is a useful way, as we may be seen, to represent some of these problems. So to orient you again, this is the film out here. So this green dot is the initial film concentration. And then the bath is, of course, over here at almost pure non-solvent. And so what happens is regardless of the film thickness, I get a very similar profile or basically identical profile of how the, of how the system concentration behaves. And at early times, when it's short enough, this just stays the same. And so if this curve doesn't intersect with my, uh, uh, with my spinodal, then I'm going to get no phase separation. And so what this is really nice is this tells us that uh, you know, time and uh, distance film thickness can be collapsed to a single variable, which is, of course, what we know uh, for these kind of semi-infinite problems or when time is less than the diffusion time. And so we can play a game where we vary the initial film composition, um, and then we can see at this early time what all of the different behaviors are. And we observe th broadly three different regimes of behavior. Um, 
One is this, and this red is what I'm showing you was from the previous one. It's where nothing happens, where I get no phase separation initially. Um, in two, I get a phase separation, but it's essentially just, uh, it just sits there as two immiscible domains. The most interesting case is three, where I get an immediate surf, or I get immediate uh, uh, spinal decomposition. So even though I'm outside of the spinal window, I can, uh, you know, pick something that's close enough, and it will immediately begin to phase separate. And so we can uh, look then at the morphology of these. So now I've done these 1D simulations. What happens when I do two and three-dimensional simulations? And you'll see that this echoes uh, what what I showed you. Uh, earlier, maybe let's move me over here. Okay, so I showed you earlier that when I was in uh, uh, in the high polymer concentration region, I ended up with you know isolated droplets inside a, a matrix of polymer, and I get that when I'm again at high polymer concentration. But as I move and go into the middle, I get sort of a 50-50 mixture. And here the the you know surface direct spinal decomposition is causing ordering at this front. Um, and I don't have strong enough thermal fluctuations to break that in this particular simulation. Uh, and then uh, as I move to even lower polymer concentration, now I get a uh, breakup. And uh, you can see now that I have, uh, you know, sort of isolated droplets of polymer. Um, and here this is a, a two-dimensional simulation. This is a separate three-dimensional simulation. You can see that there's some interesting differences between the 2D and 3D case where the 3D case sort of has longer aggregates that are connected, whereas 2D ends up with these sort of isolated uh, circular droplets. Okay, um, so now uh, what's interesting then is that at later times, um, and let me get my face out of the way again, um, at later times um, the wall does matter, and you can see that um, as time goes on, uh, the film concentration then uh, uh, begins to move, and it can now move into the two-phase window. And so over time, um, you know, if you go back and plot with that reduced variable, um, initially it stays here, but then over time it, it changes and, and you get uh, a phase separation. And again, um, we can sweep the initial film concentration, um, and there's some kind of interesting transients that I don't really have time to talk about. But as you know, time goes to infinity, we still end up with three different regimes of behavior. Um, and this red, blue, and green um, all represent the same thing I have before. So red means I get no phase separation. Um, blue gives me a spinal decomposition. And green means I just phase separate you know, between a, a bulk term and a, or excuse me, a bulk term. But you know, just two, uh, you know, no, no microstructure develops in either phase, okay? And so again, I can look at those and characterize those by the polymer concentration, which ends up predicting the, the local uh, concentration here. So I have this, uh, I guess I'm starting over here, at high polymer concentration, I end up with uh, polymer with isolated droplets of non-solvent. Um, then I get this sort of nearly bicontinuous phase where I get this sort of striped behavior again because the fluctuations are weak. In this particular solution, actually, I think I initiate with some noise, but the solution is uh, uh, then neglects thermal fluctuations as it moves on. Uh, and finally, I end up with low polymer concentration with isolated droplets of polymer um, or these sort of stringy aggregates in, in three dimensions. Okay? So to sort of summarize um, what we saw from these two stories, the first was a model development story um, where we looked, where we used uh, continuum fluid mechanics and classical density functional uh, approaches or polymer field theory approaches uh, to capture uh, key dynamic features. And uh, we, can, we can see uh, things in NIPS like uh, spinal decomposition, and, and I didn't have time to show you, but also Marangoni flows. Um, and then we use that to look at what happens when I have a, a, a mass transfer driven phase separation. And what we saw was that diffusion did indeed matter and that we had two time scales um, and we, that resulted in two different kinds of phase separations, an instantaneous phase separation and a delayed phase separation. Um, and uh, interestingly, the, the experimental literature also bears this out, um, and it may have implications for how macrovoids are formed. Um, uh, our model also predicts uh, you know, that there's a sequence of morphologies that depends on the polymer concentration, um, and um, we're currently looking into um, how that might also play out in the droplet case um, that you saw in the, in the Cabral paper, um, and, and to see how the theory predicts what should happen there if this indeed agrees with those experiments. So um, uh, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll, I need to wrap up.
So um, what we're doing now and in the future is we're uh, expanding to look at, like I said, nips and droplets. We're also interested in looking at non-solid induced phase separation with particles. Um, when you have solid particles included, these give rise to interesting materials called bigels, um, and uh, we think our methods are ideally suited to look at those kinds of systems. Um, uh, in terms of uh, membranes, uh, the Fredrickson group continues to work on that, and uh, my colleague Jan Garcia has a, a nice paper that just came out a few days ago in ACS Macro Letters, um, where they uh, where we postulated a, a mechanism for the formation of asymmetric membranes, and he has some nice three D simulations here um, to talk about about that. So I highly encourage you to go check that out. Um, so with that, I'll just conclude and acknowledge um, all the the work. Um, by my research group, especially uh, Rami Al-Hassan here, who uh, has done a number of simulations, and we've had some nice undergrads in the group uh, who have uh, Tim and Dakota, who have done some work in this area, and Caden as well, who is on this paper. Um, acknowledge some funding from BYU and some down Asai Kase from my time in Santa Barbara. And I'd also like to put in a quick plug um, for a new uh, project that I'm undertaking as an outreach project, um, which is a podcast that I'm doing in collaboration with a couple other faculty here at, at BYU. Um, the podcast is called How Science Happens, um, and our first season starts on January 4th, 2020, so just in the new year. There are already a couple preview episodes available on our website um, on anchor.fm slash howscience. We've interviewed a number of, of chemical engineering faculty um, and chemistry faculty uh, that are uh, uh, in soft materials, um, and so I highly encourage you to, to check it out. I think um, it should be uh, hopefully really enjoyable. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention, um, and hopefully I'll get to, to interact with you here uh, in the future. Thank you.